Welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with your host, Dr. Nick Vanterhaven, and brought to you by ECG Management Consultants. You can learn more about the show on the program's page at healthcarenowradio.com or on our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud. The U.S. spends more on healthcare per capita than any other country on the planet. So why don't we have superior outcomes? Why haven't the principles of capitalism prevailed? And why do American consumers have so much trouble accessing and paying for healthcare? Each week, Healthcare Upside Down will dive into these and other issues with ECG principal, Dr. Nick, and guest panelists as they discuss the upsides and downsides of healthcare in the US and how to make the system work for everyone. And we end with your better pill to swallow, the conclusion to today's episode with insights on challenges and changes that improve healthcare. Now here's your host, Dr. Nick. In my early days of practicing medicine, there was no concept of split roles or shared activities. For a variety of reasons, I found myself doing other things while practicing medicine, working nights and weekends in healthcare, and also holding down a regular job as a computer programmer in financial systems at Shell International Petroleum Corporation in London. The idea that someone qualified as a doctor would do anything else but doctoring was foreign thinking, and I spent a lot of my time explaining this to my friends. As an interesting side note, my fellow physicians all understood the why of this activity, and many were envious of my alternative choices, and several reached out for counsel and insights on how to make that move. But I found myself working in corporate office world with a desk, a computer terminal, and a telephone, and worked the standard nine to five with a lunch break. But Shell was a forward-thinking company with resources, and lunch in this environment was a full-service restaurant with multiple choices, all provided for free. My healthcare world experience was diametrically at odds with this. I had watched the accountants in our hospital closed the nighttime restaurant service and shed the staff and replaced them with soulless and tasteless vending machines filled with unappetizing and unhealthy prepackaged meals to save money. When I asked the question at Shell as to why they would spend this money, the answer was clear. The company viewed this as keeping their employees healthy and productive. It was worth the investment. For many, this could be the best meal they got every day, and it was fresh and nutritional. There was also a full gym, squash courts, and a swimming pool for exercise before and after work. Again, all for free. For more than half of Americans, our lifestyles have changed. We are not the same people, and we have different expectations, and everything in our lives is up for reconsideration. With the great resignation and the challenge of keeping and attracting new employees, not just in healthcare, but everywhere, perhaps the time has come for change. Join me on the Healthcare Upside Down show as I talk with Jeff Hogan. He's the president at Upside Health Advisors. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nick. It's uh, great to be here. Looking forward to a robust conversation. So you've been in this space a long time. Uh, you've had uh, you know, some interesting um, background and perspectives to this. I think, you, you know, anybody that looks at your profile will say value-based care is the pathway forward. Yet we seem stuck in, uh, what can I call it, uh, mud or sludge that refuses to move towards a better model. How do we get there? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's uh, the billion dollar or more, maybe the trillion dollar question uh, to be specific. And, you know, if we look back 16, 17 years, Harvard professor uh, Michael Porter and Dell professor Elizabeth Teesberg wrote a book um, that, that talked about this, the fact that healthcare in this country did not have open markets. Uh, in fact, that... Uh, uh, healthcare in this country have very opaque, closed markets. Uh, in fact, many may say that there are moats around the healthcare marketplace. And um, unfortunately, little has changed in that 16 or 17 years. There's 
an aspirational goal to have value-based healthcare. And what, what really, you know, if we think about it, is value-based healthcare. Value-based healthcare is outcomes focused, having predictable outcomes on both cost and quality. And isn't that crazy that we spend almost 19% of our gross domestic product on healthcare, and yet it's so fragmented and so opaque and so few people really understand it. And the answer to your question is um, suddenly um, we've, we've seen COVID come along and, and COVID has really exposed how bad our system is, how inaccessible it is, how unpredictable it is, how much tremendous variability in cost and quality exists between and among health systems be it regionally or otherwise, and also the lack of access. Um, if, we, if we think about it in March when COVID started, much of the supply side of healthcare providers and health systems, um, those that were not treating COVID directly, they shut down just like everybody else did. And we're kind of, um, I, I generally say, hiding in their homes. And it really exposed or created that existential view on the existence uh, and the mechanisms of financing of healthcare for providers who were dependent upon volume, um, but couldn't see people. Um, also the technological deficiencies in the supply side of healthcare, namely the fact that many, if not most, of these provider groups and health systems didn't have adequate um, technology, uh, virtual care, interoperability, those types of things to see their patients um, virtually uh, to be able to treat them as well. And then we had uh, the average American, if such a thing exists, who said, here I am, I'm hiding in my home, yet I can't get treatment, particularly for those that were comorbid and needed things. They needed a medication change or whatever the case might be. There was a clear exposure of the inadequacy or inappropriateness of our existing system. And, and what has happened since then to really inspire, you know, a much more, and I use the, the term at the beginning here, robust conversation around outcomes and value-based healthcare is that expectations have changed for everyone, not just in healthcare, but for many other things as well in culture. Yeah, so you bring up a, a point that I've heard, a, a recurring theme through uh, many discussions, you know, the silver lining relative to COVID-19 and, you know, the pandemic has exposed all of this. But at the beginning, you said something that, you know, really I found quite extraordinary because I think contextually when I talk to other people, their perception is different. And you said we don't have an open market. Yet when I talk to Americans, they are fiercely defending the U.S. healthcare system, in part because I have a choice. It's a it's a marketplace. And yet you're saying we don't. How do you reconcile that? Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a great question. It's a it's really a terrific question, and you know it it comes down to looking at results. Um, I I'm a, a big fan of data, um, and if we if we look at data in particular, I've been a fan of the RAND Hospital Transparency Report. And uh, this is published generally uh, on an annual basis. Uh, I believe a new edition is coming out in the next month. And it really surveys the results nationally of the performance of our health systems on cost and quality uh, in aggregate or in macro to be able to compare health systems in a region in a state specifically between and among one another, and also internally, the service line. 
organs, you know, be it cancer or obstetrics or musculoskeletal and, and what have you. And really the, the proof is in the pudding that um, if we look, I reside in Connecticut, just southwest of Hartford, and actually participated in dragging um, the state's all payers claims database data into the RAND report for the first time for this region. We have huge variation. What does that mean? Total cost of care differences of close to 30% between the highest performing health system, lowest cost, highest quality, and the largest system, you know, which is lower quality and higher cost. So we have this huge differential. It is proof that in fact, we don't have open markets. People do not comprehend the huge variation that exists in, in cost and quality. How, um, how would we have this if we can prove that the highest volume of services for an employer, let's say it's uh, arthroplasties and babies and things of this nature, have a 30 or 40 or 50% differential in pricing and quality in a given region. This is not front of mind. We do not know what things cost or where quality exists because our markets are closed. You know, the largest variable in a health plan from a inflationary point of view, and Americans suddenly are starting to comprehend what inflation is, uh, is pharmacy. I mean, it's a out of control beast. Um, and all we have to do is look at the typical PBM to understand, um, and I use my metaphor here, uh, the modern PBM is basically the ASEAN regime, you know, the landed gentry, uh, and there is absolutely no vision around how these things work or what things cost or what those differentials are, even the efficacy of drugs. Um, so my, my answer to you is that um, healthcare marketplace uh, notion in this country it's a myth, and it's very easy to prove that it's a myth. So great points. I think, you know, I can't disagree with the, the fundamentals there. But what that raises in my mind is the capacity to make choices. And, you know, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a qualified physician. And even I feel inept sometimes when I'm trying to select care. I have, you know, a number of uh, pathways I've followed that have challenged me, even with the level of understanding that I think is at least moderately superior to the average individual. And I've struggled. So the idea that the individuals can make those choices, for me, is a, a, a difficult proposition. I think it's difficult for most individuals, yet they want to. I mean, on this show, I've talked to people who talk about the chief health officer for the family, who ultimately is probably um, the, the woman in the family because they tend to take the majority of the, the load of caring not only for themselves, but, you know, the extended family. But are they equipped? Can we equip them? Or should that purchasing thought process be vested elsewhere. Right now it's with employers. You know, that's a whole other shtick with me that I, I, I feel like it's a, the fifth leg in, you know, a, a system that is faulty. Who should the purchaser be? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, post-World War II, we uh, created uh, the institutionalization of employer-sponsored uh, health. Um, so, so basically, uh, healthcare became a means for employers to attract and keep employees. And for better or for worse, we've we've had that um, going back to 1946, 1947 as the genesis of it. And uh, it's become for most employers the second largest expenditure that they make. Um, after wages. Uh, and it's, it's huge. I mean, I work on some very, very large employer plans where a family plan now costs $39,000 a year. You know, think about that, the dollars that it takes 
from a discretionary point of view out of people's pockets and, and things of this nature. So, so the, the answer to your question is somewhat complex. Um, you know, uh, have, have thought about this quite a bit. And I'll tell you that you know, prior to COVID, the notion of the healthcare consumer was an oxymoronic notion. It really was. Um, and, and now with COVID, it, it seems that, you know, expectations have changed dramatically, not just for healthcare, um, but for things in general. Um, Americans are looking at things uh, very differently. And I, I don't want to go down a hole, but I'll tell you, yesterday, um, I was listening to an economic summit with the great American pollster, um, Frank Luntz, um, who really looks at the nuance of uh, how Americans are looking at things and what's different and, and what have you, you know, uh, knowing we'd have this call today, I, I, I wrote down a quotation that I think really speaks to this question specifically. And, and his quote was that more than half of Americans, their lifestyles have changed. Um, we are not the same people. We have different expectations and everything in our lives is up for reconsideration. And this is a big deal. You know, he calls it the great American rethink. And because this was an economic forum, his warning was to the CEOs of American companies to say, you know, the days of you keeping your employees uh, and that loyalty just for being loyal are gone. Um, that you are going to have to do more to attract and keep employees. Your culture is going to have to be better. You're going to have to do things that actually shows that they're important. And I think to answer your question specifically, we now have this new healthcare consumer who is in the game. You know, in the past, employers. Uh, had given up agency for the management um, of their health plans to HR folks who were very nice and what have you. But the CEOs and CFOs of companies had very little say, very little agency over price or the economics or who the buka carrier was that they brought in. And now suddenly we've got this, um, this new employee out there who has choices um, who can go elsewhere, who is going elsewhere and saying, you've got to do better by me. I want you to give me a plan that gives direction, uh, that has quality outcomes, that gives me access to care 24 seven, even in my home, that gives me appropriate behavioral resources and what have you. So, so think about that. The CFO of that company must come back in to decision-making around the health plan. Why? Because he or she is the one who has to make those financial decisions. And what are the big choices in health plans? You know, I, I mentioned it before. What, what is the triage of high volume procedures and high cost procedures, knees and hips and babies and shoulders, and you know, we can go on and on, cancer care pass and what have you. That CEO, CFO can no longer afford to pay five and 700% of Medicare for the highest volume and highest cost procedures. He or she must bring this nuance to their plans and predictability. So, so how does value-based healthcare come into the mix? You know, the whole notion of using attributed tech-enabled advanced primary care clinically integrated to targeted price and warranted episodes of care, alternative payment methodologies is the way to create that accountability. And the other big thing it does for employers, about 62% of which are self-funded in this country, is that it deals with the big problem of catastrophic claims or asymmetric risk. You know, those big claims that hit stop loss and things of this nature, if we can bring this predictability into this space, it becomes much easier to finance your health plan. So 
as I unpack that, I'm listening to you and thinking that one of the critical drivers to really affecting change that will be persistent and substantial in the healthcare system that we all need and want, but have just failed to achieve, I think. I mean, certainly through my career in this country, and even learning from other countries, I don't think we can just import. We've learned that through, you know, some of the experiences when, you know, there was an attempt to try and cross and say we should look at a, a, the UK as an example. That's almost one of the extremes. And, you know, there's just the notion that you, you can't fit that square peg into the round hole of the US. We have what we have. We have employer sponsored. I think what I heard you say is that's going to persist, but it's different now because now instead of being, I I don't want to say throw away, but it, it wasn't a focus. It was, we're just going to offer it. We now have to actually deliver positive experience value. So if you were to describe that and, and guide those individuals, What would be the critical elements that you would offer and say, this has to be part of what you're delivering to your employees? Yeah, so it's a a great question. It's it's also a huge question we could spend a couple hours on, but we won't. Um, And I'll I'll tell you, it's um, uh, the, the most intelligent employers, the most motivated employers, those who really need uh, to to provide a better way are finally looking at their employees and even classifications of employees, tool and die makers, and those that are critical to uh, the business and saying, um, we are going to look at you holistically. So, So what does that mean? That means that they're not just considering their employer sponsored health plan, they're including the benefits, you know, which includes time off and vacation and nutrition, um, even the assets they bring to bear at the place of employment, whether it's on-site advanced primary care, um, it could be at-home care, behavioral resources, infertility benefits. What does our employee actually want and need? Imagine that, asking them what they actually want. And um, this, I'm, I'm throwing this in deep into our conversation, um, but the place that the moat um, has not been blocking the employer from having agency over these decisions is on the occupational health side. Um, this has been an area where the agents and brokers aren't blocking and you know uh, causing them not to be able to find this information and do these direct contracts and things like this. We've finally seen uh, employers saying, we're not gonna balkanize our employer-sponsored health plan and our uh, occupational health strategies Um, designed to uh, not only attract and keep employees, but to keep them healthy longitudinally, not just for the short term and not in a commoditized way. And what does that mean? Actually uh, contracting the supply side of healthcare um, so that both sides are taken care of and both sides are contracted at risk uh, for important outcomes. Fantastic. Unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time. Just remains uh, to thank you for joining me, Jeff. Thanks for, for the conversation. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thanks so much. The world we live in has clearly had a dramatic change. This is no small adjustment, but a tectonic shift in our experiences and importantly, our expectation. This applies to all employees and employers, but for healthcare, we have to think about it not just from our employees' perspective, but also from the solutions we offer to this changed society. Our system of care needs to shift from healthcare to well care, taking a holistic approach to the individual and the extended family. For example, the data from a four day working week trial shows clear benefit and improved efficiency. That alone should inform the outdated U.S. vacation policies. Your better pill to swallow? 
is to rethink your own employee packages. The value add of health and wellness is no longer nice to have, but an essential tenant of what you offer your employees. Think about all aspects of that cocoon that rises beyond health insurance and contribution to gym membership and wraps the employee in a caring environment that accounts for all our individual needs, spanning basic nutrition, vacation, housing, into a full occupational health, wellness, and full-featured healthcare offerings for employees to pick from. And for healthcare, how do we offer services that meet this emerging need? Thanks for joining me, your host, Dr. Nick, on this week's edition of Healthcare Upside Down. Until next week, keep solving the business of healthcare as if your life depended on it, as one day soon, it will. That's all the time we have for today. You can find all of our episodes on your favorite listening platform by searching for Healthcare Now Radio. Also, check out our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud for summaries and commentary from each episode. Follow our show's social hashtag HC Upside Down. And join us each week as we work to solve the business of healthcare for everyone.